Hi, I'm David, and this is the Biology Classroom. This is a paper discussion video, so get ready with this paper, and let's go through the questions and answers together. Question 1 is about the Zika virus. A is the capsid. It is the protein shell that surrounds and protects a virus genetic material. You can also refer to it as a protein coat. The subunit is called a capsomere. Nucleic acid can be found in the capsid. It may be DNA or RNA. Even though organisms like animals and plants do not have single-stranded DNA, a virus can have it. Note that the question wants you to name the molecule. The term nucleic acid is too general and not credited. B1 wants you to calculate the actual diameter of a Zika virus. Actual diameter equals image diameter divided by magnification. First, measure the image diameter in millimeters. Then, convert it to nanometers. After that, divide it by the magnification of the photomicrograph. The resolution of a microscope is the ability to distinguish between two points. It determines the detail that you can observe when using the microscope. C. Describe the similarities and differences between the transmission of Zika virus disease and the transmission of malaria. They are both transmitted by vectors. A disease vector is a living organism that transmits pathogens from one host to another. The vectors for both diseases are mosquitoes. The vectors feed on the infected host blood and take up the pathogen. When they feed again on an uninfected individual, the pathogen is transmitted. This is known as a blood-borne disease. You can get a maximum of two marks from these similarities. The vector of malaria is Anopheles rather than Aedes. Only the female mosquitoes can transmit the disease to humans, as male mosquitoes do not take a blood meal. D1 wants you to explain how a vaccine can lead to the development of long-term immunity. The proteins in the vaccine are non-self-antigens. It is a molecule that is recognized by the immune system as foreign, hence triggering an immune response. If this is the first encounter, a primary immune response is stimulated. There are many B and T lymphocytes in our body with different receptors. Specific lymphocytes use their complementary receptors to bind to the antigen and get activated. This is known as clonal selection. Clonal expansion will then occur where the cell divides by mitosis to produce a clone. This is stimulated by cytokines released by T helper cells. Some of the lymphocytes specialize into memory T and B lymphocytes. They circulate in the body and provide immunological memory. Providing any further details can give you two marks. You can state the type of immunity that vaccination provides, or give details on how memory cells can confer long-term immunity. You can also describe how a secondary immune response can help prevent illness during a subsequent encounter. 2. Explain how a vaccination program may limit the spread of Zika virus disease through a population. This question talks about the program, not the vaccine itself. Therefore, do not discuss how a vaccine can lead to immunity in an individual. A vaccination program can lead to herd immunity where a large proportion of the population is immune. This will protect the unvaccinated people as they are less likely to be in contact with an infected person. This is important because they are individuals in a population who are not suitable candidates for vaccination. For example, those who are immunocompromised may need to avoid certain vaccines. When there are fewer suitable hosts, the likelihood of breaking the transmission cycle increases. There is a mark for AVP. You can discuss how an effective vaccination program may achieve a high percentage coverage. You can also relate the need for vaccination to the R0 value, which is a mathematical term that describes how contagious an infectious disease is. 2a. Describe the structure of a collagen molecule and the structure of a collagen fiber. Three helical polypeptides form a collagen molecule. It is called a triple helix. The helical chains are tightly wound but we don't call it an alpha helix because the chain is not as tightly wound as an alpha helix. Hydrogen bonds hold the chains together. It is mainly due to the presence of many glycines and prolines in the polypeptides. In each polypeptide, 
every third amino acid is glycine. Glycine is the smallest amino acid. It allows the three polypeptide chains to pack closely together. A single collagen fiber may contain thousands of individual collagen molecules. They are cross links or covalent bonds between the molecules. The molecules are arranged in parallel. They show staggered ends. This means the ends are not aligned. Staggered ends increase their tensile strength and prevent the formation of weak spots. There is a mark for AVP. You can discuss the importance of glycine in collagen and the arrangement of collagen molecules into fibrils before forming the fibers. B shows a disaccharide bonded to the amino acid hydroxylysine. D is a hexose as it has six carbon atoms. It has a five carbon member ring and hydrogen is found above the plant on carbon number one. These are the features of an alpha glucose. A glycosidic bond is a covalent bond that links monosaccharides together. It is found between D and E. To identify the R groups, we first need to locate the central carbon, which is situated between the amide and carboxy group of the amino acid. The R group is found opposite the hydrogen atom. C wants you to suggest how a named tissue or structure is affected in a person who has a collagen deficiency. Due to its excellent tensile strength and stability, collagen plays an important structural role in our body parts, such as the walls of blood vessels, cartilage, and skin. Without their mechanical support, these structures become weaker and may be easily broken or ruptured. You can also get this mark by describing how this may affect the function of the tissue or structure. 3A wants you to complete the table to show the features of different blood vessels. Smooth muscle is found in the tunica media of both arteries and veins. This allows them to have vasoconstriction and vasodilation. Capillaries are only one cell thick, so they do not have this layer. This is important for a short diffusion distance. The endothelium is a thin layer of squamous epithelial cells that lines the interior surface of all blood vessels. The tunica media is the middle layer of a blood vessel's wall composed of smooth muscle cells and elastic tissue. Capillaries only have a single layer of endothelium. B1 wants you to show the direction of movement of oxygen and carbon dioxide during gas exchange in the lungs. Oxygen moves from the alveolar space into the blood while carbon dioxide moves in the opposite direction. They move down their partial pressure gradient. 2. Suggest and explain how a steep oxygen concentration gradient is maintained in the lungs. Blood arriving in alveolar capillaries comes from the pulmonary artery. It is the deoxygenated blood that has entered the right side of the heart from the vena cava. So, it has a lower partial pressure of oxygen. Then, gas exchange takes place as shown in the previous question. Oxygen is taken up by hemoglobin in the red blood cells, forming oxyhemoglobin. The newly oxygenated blood is continually removed. It is passed to the pulmonary vein to be transported back to the heart. This means that the carbon dioxide rich blood constantly arriving at the lungs and oxygen rich blood is removed continuously. There is a large network of capillaries near the alveoli. This provides a large surface area for the process to take place. Ventilation or breathing allows more oxygen to enter the alveolar space. We inhale oxygen-rich air and exhale carbon dioxide-rich air. This ensures the partial pressure of oxygen is always higher in the alveolar space compared to the blood. You can use this point to get the AVP mark. In C, we have a passage with a few blanks. The pulmonary vein carries blood to the left atrium. It is the vein that delivers blood from the lungs to the heart. The valves found in the aortar and the pulmonary artery are the semilunar valves. They prevent the backflow of blood from the arteries into the heart. Blood is supplied to the cardiac muscle by the coronary arteries. They are the arteries that wrap around the outside of the heart. 4a. Describe and explain the roles of lignin and suberin in the transport of water through the roots and stem of a plant. Lignin and suberin are hydrophobic. They are impermeable to water and act as a waterproof barrier. This means that they do not interact well with water. Lignin is found in the cell walls of xylem vessel elements. Lignified walls 
prevent water from leaving the xylem, thereby preventing loss of water from the xylem. This ensures that water remains within the xylem vessels, preventing it from leaking out and facilitating its efficient transport from the roots to the leaves. Lignin also exhibits high tensile strength. It prevents the inward collapse of xylem vessels. There is a negative pressure when water is transported through xylem vessels. Lignin provides strength and is commonly used as a secondary thickening for structural support of different plant cells. Suberin is found in the Casparian strip in endodermal cells. The Casparian strip is a hydrophobic, ring-like band in the cell walls of endodermal cells that act as a barrier for water. Their presence causes water to move from the apoplast pathway to the symplast pathway, as water can no longer move through the cell wall. This allows for the control of solutes before they enter the xylem, preventing the entry of unwanted substances. There is a mark for AVP. You can discuss how the adhesion of water molecules to hydrophilic parts of lignin preventing the collapse of water column and how lignification causes the death of xylem vessel elements. B shows the formation of lignin. The figure shows a change in the shape of the active site. This is the induced feed action. The active site shape is not fully complementary to the substrate shape before binding. The substrate induces the active site and alters its shape to better fit with it. The interaction causes it to become fully complementary, leading to the formation of an enzyme subject complex. Lecase lowers the activation energy. It is the minimum energy required to start a chemical reaction, acting as an energy barrier that reactants must overcome to transform into products. The diagram shows that the enzymes lowers the activation energy by bringing the substrate closer together, allowing the bonds to form more easily. If the activation energy is not reduced, substances require a greater amount of kinetic energy to collide and form a bond. After that, the case returns to its original shape. The product leaves the active site. The enzyme is ready to catalyze another reaction. There is a mark for AVP. You can discuss the role of copper ions as cofactors and the temporary bonds that form between the substrate and the enzyme's active site. 5A wants you to outline the main stages in the process of cell signaling by ligands. After being secreted by the sending cells, ligands are transported through the blood. It will bind to the specific receptors of the target cells. They have complementary shapes. The binding sets off reactions within the target cell. For example, some ligands trigger the secondary messenger pathway, causing an enzyme cascade within the cell. The target cell will then have some changes, and this is the response. B. State and explain how the CDK inhibitor prevents the activities of the CDK molecule. Since it does not bind to the active site, it is a non-competitive inhibitor. It binds to the allosteric site. You can also describe it as a site other than an active site. The binding affects some of the bonds in the tertiary structure of the protein, causing a change in its overall shape, which in turn affects the shape of the active site. The enzyme loses its specificity as the active site is no longer complementary to the substrate. C1 wants you to choose which CDK inhibitor is likely to result in a cell containing one chromatid per chromosome. Each chromatid is one DNA molecule. After DNA replication during the S phase, the chromosome consists of two sister chromatids joined at a centromere. So, the inhibitor that affects the S phase would show the effect. It prevents DNA replication from occurring, so the sister chromatid is not formed, resulting in a chromosome with only one chromatid. 2. State which CDK inhibitor is likely to result in a cell with a relatively high concentration of mitochondria and two chromatids per chromosome. Since there are two chromatids per chromosome, we can rule out the two inhibitors in the previous question. The only option is RO3306. Mitochondria replicate by binary fission and divide during the G2 phase of interface, ensuring an adequate supply for the daughter cells after mitosis. The inhibitor prevents a cell that has undergone replication from entering mitosis, resulting in a greater number of mitochondria 
because they are not being divided between the daughter cells. D. Explain why CDK inhibitors can be used to treat cancerous tumors. Cancerous cells divide uncontrollably and infinitely. These inhibitors can stop the cell cycle before mitosis and cytokinesis. This stops the uncontrolled cell division that can cause an increase in tumor size. In other words, the cancerous cells cannot increase in number. Describe three ways in which the structure of mRNA differs from the structure of DNA. Note that you can only compare the structures, not their functions and locations. mRNA is single-stranded, while DNA is double-stranded. During transcription, only one strand of DNA is used as the template to form the mRNA. Complementary base pairing is only present in DNA as mRNA has only one strand. The pentose sugar in mRNA is a ribose sugar, while DNA contains deoxyribose sugar. Ribose has a hydroxyl group at carbon 2, whereas deoxyribose has a hydrogen atom. mRNA contains uracil but not thymine. DNA contains thymine but not uracil. mRNA is shorter and have fewer nucleotides. Only a section of DNA is copied during transcription. Cells do not synthesize an mRNA molecule from the whole length of DNA. B shows some synthetic bases. Purine bases have two rings, so the answer is P and B. The CG pair in DNA is more similar to the synthetic pairs. They are held together by three hydrogen bonds as well. A and T only have two hydrogen bonds between them. That's all for today. If you think my videos are useful, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me at the comment section. Thank you for watching and see you again soon.